Hello, welcome to the Trend Talk. I'm Maravina Jaimes. And I'm Bel Hernandez. Maravina, can we talk about the kids staying home and the consequences of the kids not being able to go to school right now? Right, and, and moms not being able to go to work. Right, that is one of the results because they have to, who's gonna take care of the kids? Right. And all moms, of course, you know, once you have a kid, your your heart and your mind are divided. So you've got to make sure that your kids are OK, are okay so that you can tend to work. Um, I don't know how they're going to solve this problem. You know, there was a problem and there is a problem of when it's normal, where women have to do so much. And they're the ones that are the primary caretakers of the kids. So they're the ones that are rushing off to school and coming back and taking them to their after school activities, making sure they do their homework. And that is stressful. But now the, the stress is on staying home because mm -hmm. they're not out there making money. And it really puts a strain on the finances. Well, and on the other side of this, of course, is, you know, uh, the push to go ahead and get kids back into school. But the problem is also, I mean, if we've had issues with school districts not doing so well as far as the actual buildings of the schools and sometimes air conditioning and space for the kids, yeah. are we really going to trust that they are going to do everything they need to do to make sure that the environments are, um, you know, COVID safe? That's well, that's why it was great because uh, if the new administration's uh, plan works about opening schools. That's what they want to provide. Kids need to be in school. They definitely need to be in school for a lot of reasons, not only education, but also the socialization. It's very hard to socialize on Zoom, although you and I have been doing this, Belle, for over, almost a year. But speaking of socializing, you know, one of the things that is missed because we can't get together in large groups is theater. We'll be chatting it up today with Hero Theater Company Artistic Director Elisa Bocanegra. She's going to tell us what theater and environment have in common. And keeping in the theme of theater, we have with us Jose Luis Valenzuela, who is the Artistic Director of the Los Angeles Theater Center and founder of the Latino Theater Company, and they have some exciting news about keeping theater going for another 30 years in Los Angeles. So go get your cafecito and come back and join us with Elisa Bocanegra. Hi, my name is Elisa Bocanegra and I'm producing artistic director of Hero Theater. I'm Puerto Rican uh, from New York. I was actually born in North New Jersey. I'm the youngest of eight kids. Uh, my parents are from Puerto Rico. Uh, I started acting at the age of 16. Uh, I began my career with the Puerto Rican Traveling Theater Company in New York. Our first guest, Elisa Bocanegra, is the artistic director of the Hero Theater, which uses art to bring about social progress. The Hero Theater Company recently received a grant from the HITS Foundation for a 10-year initiative. She's going to tell us all about it, and we <laughs> want to congratulate you and welcome you. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. Que honor. Gracias. Thank you, Elisa. We're glad to have you. So uh, straight off the bat, why are you focusing on environment? Um, it's so interesting that you say that. Um, my family in Puerto Rico uh, survived the Hurricane Maria. And, um, and spending a lot of time in Puerto Rico post the hurricane, what I was noticing was that um, the water uh, was being rationed. Um, and that the water that my family was being allowed to drink was uh, being served in what I felt were unhealthy containers. And also the water that they were using to wash their clothes didn't seem like it was uh, water that wouldn't be something that had contaminants in it that could lead to future to illness in the future. And I just kept thinking about our older Latinx generation and how it is uh, that most of our people work day to day, agriculture workers, hard workers, but that, and where is it that uh, they're learning about the environment, what's happening to the environment, how it's affecting our communities, what they can do to keep themselves healthy, uh, healthy and to also embedder our communities and uh, help get the word out there truly. But so I just, comes in, huh? yeah, I just, I just felt like, 
it was my responsibility to almost share with my family the things that I was learning about the environment and how it was affecting us as people. Um, and and just, you know, I was like, I have to use my artistry to make some good. You know, I'm a theater artist and I have access to resources and an incredible team of actors that call me their leader. And how is it that we're gonna promote some change but help our communities? And I do think we need to start with our elder communities that are so directly affected and don't have the bandwidth to sit and like go, what is this I'm gonna learn? You know, read these pamphlets about what's going on in the environment. How do we find a way to bring the message forward? That's a, that's a wonderful way to do it through theater as they're entertained and uh, so important. But I wanted to go back a little bit to the foundation and the initiative. Um, mm -hmm. How long have you been working on this? And, and the initiative, when it says it's 10 year initiative, what is the commitment to the artistic side of that? Well, I should say, say that um, I started a program not long ago with Patrice Colors, who's the co-founder of Black Lives Matter. Um, I'm in the process of getting an MFA in environmental and social progress arts practice at Prescott College. And the work that I've been doing with Patrice has been so much about learning how artists are causing change in the world um, and learning about environmental justice. Um, so I said to myself, if I'm gonna really take this endeavor on, it's not gonna take a month or two to do. This is a commitment, a 10 year long commitment, because I also want to make it global. Our first project is based in Colombia, right? Um, Colombia, a lot of people don't know this, but it's the second most biodiverse country on the planet. And it's mm -hmm. Spanish speaking. So what a better way to, st there's no better way I feel to start with this project than to base it in Colombia. What do you mean by biodiverse? Fill us in on. <laughs> biodiverse, the most, la mas naturaleza, right? Where we get so much of our natural resources is from Colombia. The number one being Brazil, right? But it, uh, I felt Brazil, it, it's a part of Latino America, but it's not Spanish speaking. And I really thought that if our abuelos and abuelas are going to be receiving this message, we have to hear it in, in our language, right? And um, it has to be accessible. We don't see a lot of Colombian stories on our stages and we don't see them a lot in film narrative either. So mm -hmm. this project is multimedia. My goal is to start with the stage, incorporate some media elements like film elements into the actual live productions and then move it on to scripted television content. Wow, it's, it's a wide, wide scope, wonderful. You're reaching you. like different ages, right? Right. Yes, you can see why I said this is going to be the next 10 years of my life because these, it, it takes time. You know, anything good takes time. So you were saying that, um, so you have the hero theater, but then there's the hero multimedia. So yeah. you are going to be cross pollinating. Is that yes. what you know? Yeah, because um, obviously with the theater right now, what the pandemic has taught us is that we it is smartest to. Um, to definitely incorporate a multimedia element, but also I'm thinking about how is it that we can get the word out to the maximum amount of people. That's the main focus of the project is to cause change, right? Um, and to infuse act, um, you know, a sense of activism in our community uh, for the environment. So, if the way to do that is to do it more through a multimedia way, then that you know that 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 was why that was the whole reasoning behind becoming a, a multimedia company as well. Well, well, very, very exciting. You have uh, one of the most famous mentors, um, writer, director, Maria Irene Fornes, who is a legend in theater. Mm -hmm. Tell us about her, your relationship, and what you learned from her. Wow. <laughs> it was interesting because Irene um, was a Cuban woman who had won 11 Obie Awards. And my work with Irene, I mean, I, as a young actress, I was um, privileged enough to sit in the rehearsal rooms and watch Irene work. Um, and that was life changing. And what was amazing to me was also that Irene took time out to have a training unit for, it was called the Hispanic Playwrights Lab at Intar in New York. And she trained some of our most legendary La uh, Latinx writers, Migdalia Cruz, Nilo Cruz, Luis Alfaro. Mm -hmm. And it was through this training unit, working with this um, incredible woman that Irene was, that many of these artists felt like they found their true voices. Some of them had gone through graduate programs and they said they hadn't learned how to write a play yet. Mm -hmm. um, so that was 
you know, that was it, it, starting my career sitting in a rehearsal room and watching her work was an incredible experience. Now, cut two years later, I became a producer and I wanted to um, bring Irene's work into the classic American canon, the canon that John Guare, Tennessee Williams, white male playwrights were part of. Mm -hmm. I always believed Irene had as many awards as they did, um, as many accolades for her work, but she wasn't receiving the same amount of notoriety nor the same amount of productions. And I was convinced that it was because she was a queer immigrant Cubana. And I don't Ooh. think that people were ready for that. Um, and so part of my work as a producer is also to continue Irene's legacy. Um, she left us not long ago, um, but she really didn't leave us because the footprints that Irene has left in American theater are great. And she was a Latina. During this COVID period, you've had a lot of collaborations with other theaters online. Tell us about that. We had a project not long ago with the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. I was an actor at the festival many years ago. And um, I, uh, I won the country's, um, I was one of the recipients of the country's biggest leadership grant. And that afforded me to work for several seasons at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. Um, and I learned a lot about producing there. Um, but it was always my dream to have a collaboration with Oregon Shakes and Hero Theater because they're two my two artistic homes, right? So that was the first time we had done that, um, and it was a virtual production of Twelfth Night, a translate like a modern translation of of Shakespeare's Twelfth Night, which is about siblings and love, and it's based on an island. So that was an incredible experience um, wow. because we had a pretty big viewership. They were very generous with us. Um, and that was uh, a lot of our, our actors have come through the Oregon Shakespeare Festival world. So that just felt like full circle. And, you know, I, I, I and I speak with humility, but la porque we're together, estamos nosotras, verdad, juntas aquí, you know. It's just us. And I raised the viewers, but I always, um, you know, I was raised by a single mom who came from Puerto Rico. And I always have a, a, a humility and a gratitude in my heart when beautiful things happen. No matter how much I've worked towards getting something like that or, or getting invitations to speak at fancy colleges, which I do now, there's still always that kind of, that little girl, you know, who was in New York speaking Spanish at home, uh, eating Latino food and, and just um, a sense of humility I have. I, I feel very humble right now, even being with the two of you. Well, you. you are a powerhouse. I love everything that you're doing. Uh, what a shining light you are, especially in this initiative, which is the environment that a lot of us really need to get connected uh, to. So we look forward to seeing your work. We want to be supportive of what you're doing and check in with us uh, whenever you can and have something that you want to you know, let people know about. And again, congratulations on the new venture and best of luck in all of your endeavors. Thank you so much. It's called Nuestro Planeta and it's at Hero Theater. So it'll be ongoing next 10 years. We're going strong. All right. And we are here. We're going to continue our conversation in theater with the Latino Theater Company's artistic director, Jose Luis Valenzuela of the Los Angeles Theater Center. Our next guest is a professor emeritus at the UCLA School of Theater, Film, and Television. He's a respected, loved, and multiple award-winning film and theater director. You may know his work uh, from directing Luminarias or one of the many plays, Destiny of Desire, among others. He's the founder of the Latino Theater Company and the artistic director of the Los Angeles Theater Center. Please welcome Jose Luis Valenzuela. Hi, Jose Luis. Hi, Maravina. How are you? Excellent. I wanted to um, I, uh, talk a little bit about your career, your illustrious career. I mean, you were you started with one of the first teatros, which was Teatro de la Esperanza. And you have now come to be this noted professor, noted artistic director and the founder and the manager of the Los Angeles Theater Center. But tell us about your journey of starting with teatro and then coming all the way to where you are now. That was my choice. My beginning is with Teatro Chicano. With the, I actually started with Teatro de la Gente in San Jose. It was the idea of 
doing theater for the people. Uh, essentially, we never thought this was a career, but this was, you know, you were in a, in a theater company. Then I went to Teatro de la Esperanza and, and for eight years, and then I moved to Los Angeles in 1984. And different because there, it was not a company, so I created the Latino Theater Company with other members, with a, a, an amazing group of people. And uh, it was, uh, it's been an amazing journey. And, and then I became a professor in 94. And, you know, then we took over the LATC in 2006. And, you know, it's been mostly work, uh, just because the idea of what theater has to do with the people and what's important to us from the beginning. I mean, it's always been doing Latino theater, Chicano theater, theater that uh, presents uh, our people in a better light and in a better way. and and with more complex uh, characters and, and ideas about who we are. It's really it's really how I started. I mean, I, I started and I never stopped. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I've had the pleasure of being directed by you uh, in Luis Valdez's Bandido, which is actually where I worked with Enrique Castillo. Yeah, that's uh, right. But uh, we want to ask you, COVID, I mean, just a little bit about how um, you have continued to do theater during COVID. What, what have you been doing? Oh, my God. Well, I mean, uh, it, it got us by surprise, of course. You know, I mean, we closed the theater in March 14, then last year, 2020. Uh, we, we couldn't get be in the building, so we we decided that we are going to stream the archival footage of stuff that we had on footage. And so we have to go through SAG and special contracts to be able to to show some of the archival footage uh, from the company, from the Latino theater company, which is the, the, the kind of the footage that we own. And it was kind of successful, very successful in a way, because, you know, people who's never seen or work around the world, we're able to tune in and see the work and the audience was much bigger than in the actual theater. And that was really nice. We had a lot of conversations with artists. We we tried to do some readings and tried to be as busy as we could. So that, that all of that has been good. And like I say, we took the month of November to really analyze our company. And, you know, we, we got a new extension in the lease for another 30 years, so we have the theater until 2056. So what we're really working on is in a succession plan. And the next next five years, well, we're going to bring new company members, new people into the theater to really take over because uh, for by 2026, hopefully we'll have a whole new regime and the Latino Theater Company and the LATC of new people and uh, with the strategic planning and trying to find, you know, how we are going to live a stable company for the future, for for this new generation to come. That's really yeah. what I've been doing. And congratulations on that, you know, on your extension. First, you got an um you were a, got a management agreement for uh, I think was 15 years or 20 years, 20 right? Years, 20 years. And now you have, um, I guess uh, they loved what you're doing and I think the community loves what you're doing. And I think that that's why you've got another extension for 30 years. And yeah, that's interesting that you say, you know, you have to, uh, there's gotta be a, a way that it's gonna be passed on because, um, it would be great if we lived another 40 years, ¿verdad? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but um, tell us about about that journey. I mean, you put together um, a company, and then um, the Latino Theater Company went from there to the taper. That's when Maravina um, was directed by you. And um, the important work that you've been doing at LATC has also extended with other works from other um, voices across the country in LA. Tell us about that and, and what your future um, is going to include in that sense. Uh, well, I mean, we started with, uh, with uh, when I came into LA and I had been in a company for around 20 years, I had never was by myself, we dis I decided to have a workshop with actors in Los Angeles, if you remember, Bell. <laughs> and and uh, I, think I actually, you were in my first, first workshop at Plaza de la Raza. I remember yes. very, very well. And uh, so we had a workshop 
And out of that workshop, I think there were, we started with 22 actors and, and then we ended up with around 10, I'm gonna say. And, uh, you know, some of them like, you know, went out to do their own careers, which was great. And, 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 and now it's only, I think Lucy, Jeff, Sal, Evelina, and myself who are left out of those 10. And all of those people were, uh, I, I really wanted to get this part in about when uh, the LATC, which was run at that time by um, Diane White. And, and Bill Bushnell. Bill Bushnell. Bushnell. Yeah. They closed, when they closed their management of the LATC, uh, tell us about what, what all of these members did because hell no, we won't go. Tell us about that. I want to hear about this. I didn't know this part of the story. Go ahead. Lisa. Yeah, when I mean, we were the company, we were producing, we had already done a bunch of plays at the LATC and uh, the LATC company, because it was a company, a uh, nonprofit, declared bankruptcy in 1991, in October of 1991, and they decided to move out. And we as a company decided not to move out and to stay inside the building. And we squat for around 11 days, and we lived inside the building, all the members of the company, and people would bring us food, and you know, there were press conferences, and and we decided that we didn't want the building to close because we thought it was an important building in the city of LA. And it was a building that we felt that the artists in LA needed to have it because it was very multicultural too at the time. And uh, so we we were fighting with the, with the uh, city council to keep the building open and to give money to whoever was gonna manage the building you know, to keep it open and to be able to provide spaces for people of color in Los Angeles. I just find that so beautiful. It's a complete circle. Right. It's a complete circle. But when you're talking about that, then Gordon Davidson, who was the artistic director of the taper, came to us when we were inside the building and said, yes, move the theater company to the taper. Uh -huh. And as well, when we when we went over there and created the Latino Theater Initiative, as we did Bandido, we did a play with Culture Carpa Clash. We, right. we did like five plays in around two years, Latino plays, which it was, you know, a very important because the taper had not done a Latino play in Suit Suit. And we're talking about like 20 years later or something. So right. uh, it was important. And then, I don't know, 20 years later, we came back to the LATC to manage the building. And I think, what, I, mean, I wanna say this because I think the reason why the 30 years extension is important is because it's so important to have a space in the city of LA that belongs to us, that, that belongs to the Latino community, that we can program people of color, that we can di be diverse, but essentially that is our home where artists can work, you know? It's so wonderful to know that you are going to continue to manage this massive, gorgeous, gorgeous theater in the center of Los Angeles, where of course, um, you know, we want to uh, continue to do an homage to uh, not only our culture, but the fact that, um, you know, being bicultural and bilingual is such an important thing. And it's great that you're gonna continue to do this work at LITC. Yeah, I think what's important to you know right now, like I say, we are in a succession plan. So we are looking and interviewing people who are going to take over uh, the company for the, in, in the next five years. It will be kind of a mentorship program where we will give the new generation or the new members of the company uh, all the knowledge and all the experience that we had in the last 35 years for them to be able to run the center and for us to be able to create plays and you know with with other playwrights with young playwrights and uh, uh we started a new playwriting program a mentorship program with writers and so this is really really crucial year so we we are, all this year we're going to be interviewing people having some kind of work with people to make a decision what the company is going to look like, but at the beginning of 2020, then we're gonna start the process of transferring knowledge and, and, and ideas, and it's gonna be fantastic. 
Well, congratulations. I mean, we we all Angelinos are going to benefit yes. from you know passing the baton and have benefited from what you've done. So much wonderful work. Everyone, please go to letc.org, check out the theater, check out all of the rich productions that have been done there. And once again, congratulations, Jose Luis. This is awesome news um, that you are gonna get 30 more years. There's a plan for it to continue. And this is beautiful um, that there's a Latino theater company in LA after so long that is able to do that and continue. So thank you again, thank you for joining us. And everyone will be right back with our Trend Talk Trendsetter shout out after this. Today's Trend Talk Trendsetter shout out goes to the LA County Arts and Culture Internship Program. It's the largest paid arts internship program in the nation, and it provides undergraduate students meaningful on the job experience working at nonprofit arts organizations like concert halls and theaters and museums. For more information, go to lacountyarts.org. We want to thank you for joining us today. Please follow the Trend Talk Show on all social media platforms where you know you can always catch up on our past episodes. And please subscribe to our YouTube channel because we are building a community of trendsetters. And remember, if it's trending, we're talking. We're talking.